Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'd also like to welcome you. I'm Charlie. I'm the pastor here, and really glad you're with us. Like Mark said, we are in the, the third week of a series in Esther, and um, we spent the last couple of weeks kind of telling really this kind of the, the first half of the story. It's really all kind of the build-up to this kind of moment, and um, we start with this guy, King Xerxes, who is a historical figure. I mean, it's kind of known as this guy who thought he was a god and not, not a great dude at all. And he summons his queen to kind of come into this party that he's hosting with these guys and was probably going to do something incredibly inappropriate. And she refuses him, and he basically then just completely rejects her and kind of banishes her, and, uh, which is terrible to begin with. And then the story just gets worse. In order to get a new queen, he already has a harem, but he doesn't want one of those. And so to make a new queen, he gathers up all the best-looking virgins in all of his kingdom and brings them to his palace for one-night auditions which is a terrible story. And, and, this, and this girl, Esther, you know, I mean, all of this stuff is happening to her. And so she kind of gets gathered up, placed in the king's harem, has this one-night audition, again, against her will, and is now, uh, pleases the king and, is, and becomes the queen. And that's, that's a cool part of the story. It's what Mark talked about a couple weeks ago, that even in your worst moment, God kind of showed up for her. And, but then something happens, this guy named Haman, who becomes the second in command of the kingdom, he goes a bit on a power trip, and Esther's cousin Mordecai offends him, and it's a little bit, it's a little bit Mordecai's fault, we talked about that last week, um, but essentially then Haman makes this decision that he's going to wipe out Mordecai, and not just him, but the entire race. Basically, he has this plan for genocide of the entire Jewish people, including Esther, even though it is not known at this point by the king or Haman that Esther is Jewish. And so Haman comes up with this plan and essentially without, you know, kind of sneaks it in a little bit kind of to the king, not telling exactly who the people are he's wiping out, but essentially this king, again, who is not a good guy with very minimal details, signs like, yeah, I mean, we can, we can, we can bring genocide to this people you're talking about. I don't even know who they are. Whatever, genocide's fine. And so, and, and so, and so this is who this guy is. And so then Mordecai comes to Esther and is like, you're the only one that can save us. You're the only one that can save us. You're going to have to go talk to the king. And she's like, I can't talk to the king. You don't go to the king without permission. If you go to the king without permission and he doesn't raise his scepter to kind of bless you, then, then, he, then he kills you. And, and, and again, if this were some sort of love story between Xerxes and Esther, she wouldn't have anything to worry about. But this is not a love story. This is a, a tyrannical a crazy evil dude who thinks he's a god. And so she is rightly freaked out about it. And, uh, but she makes a decision with Mordecai's encouragement and with the kind of the support of her community. She says, I, I, will, I will try and do this. And so this is kind of where we're going to end up here in Esther chapter 5. But Mark and I were talking this week that why, why we think it's been important for us um, for the last couple of weeks to kind of, we'll just say, demythologize. Um, uh, it, the story a little bit, kind of we, we sanitize it and kind of like, well, let's not sanitize, let's talk about how real this story is. Because it's kind of an ugly story, it's kind of a dirty story, it's kind of, it's kind of gross in some spots. And, and it's a terrible situation that this incredible woman, Esther, finds herself in. And we feel like that's been important, not only in this story, but there's a lot of Bible stories like this where you can feel like if you tell it one way, it's like, okay, the moral of the story is when perfect people do good things for God, God shows up. And you're like, oh, that's real sweet. That's real sweet that God's doing all of these great things for these perfect people in the Bible with these perfect lives. But I'll never be that. If you knew my story, then you would know how none of these Bible stories connect to me. David is perfect. Moses is perfect. Paul is perfect. Esther has this perfect life. All these characters are perfect, and then they do these great things for God, and God shows up, and it's great for them. But what about me? And I assure you, um, when you actually read the story and you let the Bible speak for itself, these are people not leaving clean lives. These are people who, who had a lot of baggage, did, did a lot of bad things. And, and someone like Esther, who, who has been through a rough patch, all of which, none of which was her fault. And you think about this story... We, want to, we wanted to emphasize that first part of the story because we want you to believe you are in this story. 
Perfect people doing good things for God, you don't feel like you're in that story. You're in this story. You are a person here with a past who feels like because of what has happened to you in your past, you don't believe really that the weight of doing something awesome for God is, is, can be on you. I, I can't do something great for God. I can't, I can't be awesome. I can't be amazing because of this. And whatever this is, there is a worse story in the Bible of someone who something like that has happened to, but worse, that you can find yourself in. So I want you to see yourself here because I want you to believe that the awesome thing that God does through Esther can be done through you. And I want to make sure this is clear because this, again, sometimes I'm just preaching to myself here a little bit. But I have a, my, my most, most of my familiarity with this story comes from kind of kids' classrooms when I was a kid and, and youth group and these kinds of things. And so Esther finds herself, here's the story, Esther finds herself in a difficult situation and she does what's right even though it's hard, therefore don't do drugs. <laughs> right? It, was, it, became a, it was a peer pressure story. Okay, don't do drugs, don't drink alcohol, don't have sex, don't go to the dance. Really, you shouldn't do anything. Just hang out here in the corner by yourself and, and be safe, right? That was the point. And some of you, I'm not gonna, I don't want to minimize that. Some of you need that. <laughs> and we'll find another passage that talks about you need to make better decisions, okay? That's not what, but that's not what this passage is about. This is passage is about you having the courage to do what God has called you to, to make a real impact in the world. That's what this is. To love someone who the world has decided is unlovable. To bring, to bring truth that is needed to someone when it is difficult to say it to them. To bring hope and life to the people who are broken and hurt and in desperate need of Jesus Christ. To change the world by bringing life and hope to people who need it. That's what she does. And that's what you can do. And so I want you to, even before we even kind of get into this section of the story, I want that to already be in your head. That is it possible for me, like Esther, to carry weight in order to bring hope and change and life to people who need it? All right, so here we are. She's already said, at the end of, when we talk about our recap, she has already decided that she's going to do this. She's going to fast. Mordecai... And, and, his, and his people are going to fast, and they're all just going to have this time of commitment and focus before she goes and approaches the king. Now she's going to approach the king. <clears throat> Esther chapter 5, verse 1. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw King Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her, and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be given you. So she has this moment of fear of like, what's going to happen? He could be, I could catch him on a bad day, and he's not going to like that I interrupted him in his, in his, in his little kingdom thing here, and, and, and his palace. And he's going to be upset with me and I could die. But she, she goes to him, she, she faces him, and he, he does the thing that, that makes it okay. He raises her scepter, which means it's, she has permission to come and approach him. And everything's fine. And even beyond that, he's, he says to her, say, hey, listen, you obviously you are here for a reason. You wouldn't just come here just pop in. What is it that you want? And whatever it is, I will give it to you, even up to half of everything that I own and half of my land and everything. I will give half of my kingdom to you. What is it that you want? And so what we're going to look at in different aspects of this story really are kind of three, just three very simple words, three simple qualities, I suppose, three things that were necessary for Esther to be able to take the weight that has been put on her to be this world changer and ultimately succeed. And the first one is the most obvious one. It's the primary theme of the book. It's the primary quality that is modeled by this awesome woman, Esther, here in this book, and that is courage. She shows tremendous courage she puts her life on the line. She recognizes that death is a possibility for her. If I don't do something, this awful thing is going to happen to the Jewish people everywhere. There's going to be genocide for my entire people. My entire race is going to be wiped out. And if I don't do something, but I have to risk my life to do it. And courage, at its simplest, for a definition, is it's the ability to do something that's scary. 
She walks into this guy to, 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 this, to this palace room and, and, and with, this, with this dude that thinks he's a god and has already banished one queen for not performing a sexual act with him in front of all of his people. And he, he's, he's crazy. He has done terrible things to me. I'm really still here against my will, even though I found up in this, end up in a relatively good situation from it. And I'm going to risk my life here, but she does it. It's an incredibly scary thing, but it was the only way her people were going to be saved. I have to do this. And so she has the courage then to step up and to do the thing that seems incredibly hard. And so I talk to you guys and I say, hey, you can be a world changer. And I say, man, there are hurting and broken people that that desperately need someone to love them. There are people in this world who the world has completely cast aside who desperately need someone to engage them and love them. Or I say to you, hey, there are people in your world, in, in your neighborhood, where you go to school, where you work, who need the love of Jesus Christ. And God is calling you to go to them and to take that love and that truth to them. That's you. You can do that. You should do that. And no matter what of that that you hear, all of it, if we're honest, is a little bit scary. I'm going to approach someone who probably has a really bad story, something really, I'm, I'm just going to just, I'm just, what, I'm supposed to just go talk to them? I'm just supposed to just randomly go up to the people that I work with or people that I'm friends with and be like, hey, you want to you talk Jesus stuff? Like, like, I can't, like, you, can't even, you just can't even imagine. And so you get really scared. And even though, again, we don't have to, we have to feel bad that the thing that we're doing is not on, not on Esther's level. The thing that God is calling you to, it's still a little bit scary. To be a, someone who is going to bring life to the world, to bring hope to people through Jesus Christ, if it were easy, there'd be 8 billion world changers out there. But most of us get stuck in our fear, and we won't do the right thing. This happened to me uh, a few weeks ago. There's this ministry that's the people who are currently battling homelessness. And um, I went to go visit and just kind of see and kind of help out. And I'm telling you, if, if, you had, if you had been there, what you would have seen, it would have triggered you and reminded you of every junior high dance you've ever been to. So the, 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 we got there a little bit late, and, and, and they're all together there. And here I am. I'm, I'm like, I was like, I, 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 honestly, I was thinking to myself, I don't know what to do here. I'm terrible at small talk anyway, as many of you probably know, but are afraid to say out loud. Um, <laughs> only things I could think of to say are like the normal small talk things. Hey, so... You live around here? Like, that, and that, that, please don't laugh at that because it's terrible. It's terrible. Like all the things that I would think were completely inappropriate to say to this group of people. And I just got, I just got real nervous. I'm like, do I just, do I just go over there? I don't want to offend them. Like I'm so weird, and I don't feel like I'm just like, like look at here. I'm the pastor. I'm here. Like, I just, it just, and I just, I just got nervous. I got overwhelmed. And I had this idea, but it, it, something was holding me back. Like the last ten feet, I eventually got over it. And had some pretty good conversations, and it was, it was a really good time. But it was, it was, it was nerve-wracking. And there's times where I feel like that there are people that God is putting on my heart, and you need to reach out to them, they're struggling with something, and you're going to have, you need, you're gonna need to tell them some things. You, you need to reach out to this person, you're going to have to tell them something that they don't want to hear. Something that they need to hear, but may not want to hear. Um... And, and you have these kinds of moments. And I'm sure on some level you understand this, where you've got your phone out, and the easiest way to contact somebody ver- was a text. And, like, I can't even type the text. But then I type it, and I just stare at it, and I can't send it. And my worst fear is I'm going to accidentally touch the thing that sends it, and I'm going to scream. Like, like it's, it's not easy. And I don't, want, I don't want you to say that I think that it is. But what Esther had... But she had a community that surrounded her and believed in her, had her support. And whether she was at this point in her spiritual journey or not, we don't know, but God was with her. And whatever the awesome thing that God is calling you to do, you've got a community right here in support of you that would love to be with you. And you've got 
the presence of God in His Holy Spirit living in you to give you the courage to do anything that He's called you to. And so I don't know specifically if it is fear that's holding you back, but for a lot of us that it is, to take that first step with someone, to someone that God is clearly calling you to to reach out to in some way, it's that first step that can be the most difficult. And I encourage you to, to surround yourself with people who can encourage you and to trust in God's presence in you and take that step of courage towards being and becoming who God's called you to be. We continue on um, in the story. So the king has asked her, what is it you want? I'll give you half my kingdom if you want. Verse 4. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I've prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so they may do what Esther asks. You don't remember Haman is his right-hand man who is the one that essentially put the order together for the uh, genocide of the Jewish people. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. So she goes, she, she comes to him and she's like, you know, hey, whatever you want, I'll give you half, I'll give you half the kingdom if you want. Well, Esther, what is it that you want from me? And at this moment, what makes sense to us, we like, we like to tell really concise stories, we like to get to the point. What she should have said theoretically in that moment is, what is your request? I want me and my family to not be killed. You're going to kill me and my family and my friends. You should totally not do that. But that's not what she says. What she says is, you and Haman, the person who orchestrated it, you, you, you the king and this terrible guy, I want you to come to my house for a banquet. Oh, okay, well, she's going she's gonna, to she's gonna soften him up a little bit. And that's you know, apparently what happens. He has a couple of glasses of wine. He asks again. You can tell he's a little more impassioned by it. What do you want? I'm here. We're here. Haman's here. What is it that you want? You tell me what you want. I'll give it to you up to half my kingdom. And again, this is also an incredible moment. Hey, don't kill us. But again, that's not what she says. She says, if, if, serious, I understand. The, uh, if you'll just come back tomorrow night for another banquet, you and Haman, I will tell you then the thing that I want. So the king's not a dummy. He knows what's going on here. There's something that she's not getting to. And again, this story gets told a lot of different ways as far as what's going on here. At times, it feels like it was like she's second-guessing herself. Maybe she has a little bit of fear. I don't think there's any... I don't think that that's what's going on here. What what it seems to me, apart from the storytelling aspect of it, it brings a little dramatic effect, which is cool. But honestly, I I think she's doing something here to... We'll just say this. She's planning. She's put together a plan. She's got a plan, and she is executing that plan. But she doesn't want to get into it too quickly. She doesn't want it to feel rash. She wants to put Haman at ease. She wants to put him where his defenses are completely down. She wants to butter up this demigod king, guys. Like, it's like, and, and so there's this sense in which she's really just kind of taking some time to set the mood. We can't know specifically exactly. It's not completely clear all of the reasons why she did this. But here's the thing. It it is very clear that she had thought this through. And I think sometimes we get into situations where we don't think them through. We finally get the courage. It's like, okay, so you you, you, you like to be in the... Would you want a Bible study? I'm like, yeah. Like, when would it meet? I, I, I I didn't think I would get this far. You know, or it's like I, you think it through, and it's like if God's going to use you, it's like, and you begin to believe, I think that God is calling me to start some sort of Bible study in my neighborhood, or He's wanting me to reach out to people that I go to school with, or He's wanting me to kind of engage in a more intentional way with the people that I work with. You, you really should plan that. What, what specifically? What is it that you're trying to accomplish, and what is the best way to make that happen? Now, I don't want to minimize spontaneity. 
Much of your life and the things that God's called you to, a lot of it is going to be spontaneous, where you're minding your own business and you've kind of got these eyes open to like, God maybe want to use me today, and something spontaneous will happen and you need to engage with that. But the big picture things that I believe that God is wanting to do in and through your life are the kinds of things that require a little bit of forethought and planning. I mean, the the one that just immediately came to my mind is something that our family did several years ago when we became foster parents. We became foster parents with the intention of ultimately adopting. Um, We did that. There's some families that that are here that have done that. There's some families here that are currently doing that. And I will add, there are some families here that also should be doing that, that God is probably calling you to. But that's not just something that you decide one day. It's like, hey, you know what we should totally do? We should be foster parents tomorrow. You don't get to be foster parents tomorrow. It, 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 for us, it was, it was a nine-month process uh, b- uh, beginning to end before we, 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 we started our first interest meeting to when we got our first placement. It was nine months. It was lots of meetings, a lot of prep work, a lot of talking, a lot of talking to our older kids, a lot of interacting with each other. What kind of kids are we looking for? What is our plan here? What are we wanting to do? We need to make sure that we have a house that's ready. This is a big step to take, and it requires a lot of thinking it through. Because sometimes you don't think it through, and it fails the thing that we believe that maybe God is wanting us to do. Part of the reason why it fails is because we failed to plan for it. And honestly, right now, some of you, as I'm saying all of this to you about things that you could be doing, and you're like, he's suggesting that we start a Bible study with our friends who don't even go to church, or we should invite people to church, or we should talk to people about Jesus, or we should reach out to the poor and the broken in some way. What, what, what? And, and you have all these objectives, and they all pop up. And I want to tell you, is that most of your objections um, are fixed with planning. Well, I don't don't feel like I would know what to say to people. All right, what is your plan to figure that out? Well, I just don't feel like I'm mature enough. All right, what's your plan to get more mature? All of the things that you think that make you where you're not ready, you need a plan to get ready. Because here's the thing. God wants to do something awesome in and through your life. And if you're not ready, then His plan right now is to get you ready. The reality of it is, the least ready among us can make differences in the lives of people that God puts in our path. Really, it's courage. And to the degree that it's not, a lot of it is, you need to be putting together a plan to reorient your life. Most things like this don't happen accidentally. They happen because we plan to do it. I am planning to live a life that is going to make a difference in this world, and now I'm going to make a plan to do it. Now what happens next in the story is really outside of the main thrust of the story. The main thrust of the story is this incredible thing that Esther is doing, The, the, the incredible courage that she's showing, the way that God uses her to essentially bring... Uh, physical salvation to her entire people. But there's an interesting kind of little middle section here that happens in the middle of the story that we're primarily looking at where Haman comes back from this banquet. He's kind of on like a, like a power rush high. He's like, I'm awesome. There was, this, there was a banquet today. It was the king. It was the king, the queen, and me. That was the whole thing. And he's thinking that he's awesome, but by the time he gets home, he's mad. He can't, it can't just be enough for him that the king and the queen really like him because there's this one dude that doesn't like him, Mordecai. Mordecai the Jew, and I just, I just hate him. And, the, and, and his wife is like, hey man, what is wrong with you? I mean, like, you just got back from this awesome deal and now you're mad about this one dude? He's like, I just can't stand him. He just makes me so mad. And she's like, here's an idea. Why don't you build this, why don't you build this pole? Like 100 plus feet tall. And, and tomorrow you can impale him on it. Which that's the kind of encouragement spouses need to be giving to each other. You know what I'm saying? You got a problem, you all like that? Let's figure out a way to murder him, right? This is kind of, that's just good marriage. No. Um, and so he's like, that's a great idea. And at the same time, the king's having a hard time sleeping and, he, and they're reading stories from the, from the, from, from the, from the king's records. And, he start, and they start talking about the time that Mordecai saved the king's life 
by foiling this assassination attempt. And the king's like, what did we ever do to thank him? And they were like, he didn't, he didn't do anything for him. Like, we should totally thank him. Bring Haman in here. And he brings Haman in there. Like, Haman, there's a guy that I really want to do something awesome for. What should I do? And Haman's thinking, well, he's clearly talking about me. He's like, here, what you should do? You should put your king's robe on him. You put him, put him in the back of your chariot and have somebody drive that chariot around on a horse declaring how awesome the king thinks this dude is. And the king's like, that's a great idea. I want you to go do that in the morning for Mordecai. Which is just an incredible bit of just crazy irony for this guy. So he is now just beside himself with anger as he is driving around this chariot screaming, the king thinks Mordecai is awesome, right? This is, this is great, this is great. He's, he's just fuming. But in his mind, it's going to be okay. Eventually I'm going to get Mordecai on the pole. And I get to go to this um, awesome banquet again with the king and queen tonight. And we end up there, Esther chapter 7, verse 1. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom... It will be granted. Again, I think, again, the, you can see her, the way her plan is unfolding here. She's, she's got him to the point, like, like, seriously, though, just tell me. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, An adversary, an enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she's with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had set it up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. So she finally says, This is what I think. This, this guy Haman, he has ordered the extermination of my entire people. And the king, again, have, having this build up for the last couple of days. He's thinking a lot of things. I can't believe she even had to do this. Who would do this to my queen? She's clearly, it took a lot for her to even ask me. He's like, and he's just outraged. And, and he's so outraged. Like, he goes out there, I got to take a minute. And he comes back and, 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 she, and he's like fainting or such on the couch where she is. And he's like, what are you, what are you doing? And then again, with the with the final bit of irony from our little middle in the middle story, there is like he 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 gets impaled on the on the post that he had set up for for Mordecai. So she demonstrated great courage. She had a great plan, and again, a thing that I think that can hold a lot of us back. Really, maybe one of the most important pieces: follow through. Follow through. This is where a lot of us get stuck. We, 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 don't, we don't follow through. We keep going. We finally get up the courage maybe to start something, and we, and, we get, and, we, and we come up with this great plan, but at the moment of truth, something falls short. Something keeps us from really, just really doing it. I, I started to do it. I wanted to do it. I believed I could do it. I planned to do it. I was going to do it. It seemed like a great idea, but somewhere along the way, it faded. Beginning to end, from the time that Esther hears that, that this plot has happened from Mordecai to this end, is about five days. It required five days of follow-through for her. The thing that God is calling you to 
is going to require more than five days. We're talking about 20-year, 30-year, 40-year, 50-year plans that for the rest of your life, God is calling you to live a life in such a way with your eyes wide open, looking for the people that he is placing in your life that you can bring hope and life to. In the same way that Esther brought hope and life to the entire Jewish population, there are people in your life that God is calling you to bring hope to. And you have to have the courage to believe it. The courage to take the first step a plan together of how it's going to happen and then, and, and, and then just the character to follow through. So let's just pray for that for each other as we have some response time. We're going to be worshiping. There's lots of different... Uh, we have a response area in the back that we'd love for you to be a part of where you can... There's prayer candles where you can kind of lift up requests maybe for people that have already got us put on your, on your heart. There's, you can pray at the cross. We have an opportunity to take communion, which is just a way of you just personally connecting and reflecting on Jesus Christ's death on the cross for you. There's also, there's people, there's, there's cards back there for some awesome people who are already doing incredible things all over the world for God. You can pray for them. You can worship, you can pray, but let's make a commitment. Again, maybe there's not 8 billion world changers out there, but there can be a few hundred from here. But it's going to happen because we make a decision together to pray for and encourage one another to overcome all of these obstacles and to model the courage and life of this awesome woman, Esther. Let's pray. <coughs> God, I thank you. God, I thank you for the people who are here. I thank you for Esther. I thank you for this, this, this amazing story of the, just an incredibly strong, courageous woman. who even when she was still pretty young had been hurt more and had seen more than most of us will see in our entire life. But God, you showed up for her. And then God, you gave her the strength and the courage to be who she needed to be at a crucial moment in her life and in the history of your people. And God, just like with her, God, we are here for a moment like this. God, you have placed us here for a reason. And there are people that you have placed in our life. And God, I pray that we would have the courage to be the men and women you have called us to be. To bring hope and life and your gospel to people who desperately need it. So give us the courage, give us the planning, and give us the follow-through to be world-changing followers of you. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.